Well, this morning we're continuing our look at a very short uh, book of the Bible. It comes almost at the end of the New Testament, one that we know as the letter or the epistle of James. And even though I'd consider James to be one of the most practical, down-to-earth books of the whole Bible, it hasn't been without controversy down through the ages. You know, I mentioned a few weeks ago in, in, in my sermon that James was greatly disliked by none other than Martin Luther, who was one of the most famous Christians in history, the man who, who kicked off the, the, the Protestant Reformation. Luther infamously referred to James as the epistle of straw. And if Luther had his way, James wouldn't be in our Bibles. And that's because when, when Luther read James, he felt that it was all about our work instead of God's grace. So he felt with all of James's calls to do this and do that, to, to watch how we talk, to watch our mouths, to take care of the, the orphans and the widows and, and all the rest, that, that James is, is really making us feel guilty about all of our failings, how we fail to do these things. And Luther had enough guilt in his life. So he knew what it was to, to try and justify himself before God by his works, and he knew that in the end that that was not, that was not going to work, and that's why Luther, Luther gravitated towards the Apostle Paul, and, uh, who, who says in Ephesians that by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God, lest any man should boast. But as I've already said, that I believe the differences between James, St. James, and St. Paul, they've been very greatly exaggerated. And one, one reason is because when I read James, I see a whole lot of grace and a whole lot of talk of mercy, uh, both in reference to God and in reference to how we are to treat one another. And it might be a bit subtler uh, than, than Luther would have wanted, but we should not doubt that it is there. So, for example, what helps me put today's passage in perspective, all of these calls uh, to live our, get our lives right with God, to walk the straight and the narrow path, well, it helps me to remember that earlier in this same chapter, well, James makes a, a great concession to our human weakness. So I'm talking about James 3, verse 2, which I would say is a pretty underappreciated verse because that's where... The Apostle James tells us, quote, All of us make many mistakes. So can I get an amen to that, that all of us make many mistakes? That's James 3, 2. All of us make many mistakes. So like I said, in a, in a book that's not known for, for leniency, you know, there we do have grace slipping through. Because James is, he's conceding there that, that all of us, when it comes down to it, all of us are a bit screwed up and we all have the problems, problems we should be working on. And that's why there's one writer I admire, a writer who, who is very clever, I think, because he, he actually recommends, he's a Christian writer, but he says we Christians would be a lot more humble if for a time, and instead of using the word church, we substituted the phrase the International League of the Guilty. The International League of the Guilty. So how would that sound if on Sunday mornings you told your friends and your family that you were off to your local chapter meeting of the International League of the Guilty? Well, if it's the case that, that all of us make many mistakes, that isn't far from the truth. A Christian is just somebody who's recognized that and knows he or she needs help in, in overcoming that. And so I, I'd say, you know, if we started to, to think of our, ourselves as the International League of the Guilty, uh, we'd be far more likely to uh, be merciful to others, which is what James actually calls us to do again and again and again in this letter. And actually, I, I was haunted this past week by something James says way back in chapter 2, verse 13. I think it's relevant to the passage today, but that's where James says that judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy, for mercy triumphs over judgment. 
I, that verse came to mind uh, one time this week when I saw this news story. It was about a video that just went viral recently on uh, social media and was shared by millions. So I don't know if you, if you saw this, but someone who was on a, a commuter train out of uh, New York City into, into New Jersey, they secretly filmed this guy who was, who was sitting across the aisle from them. And the reason somebody uh, was filming uh, this was because there was this... this middle-aged guy, and he, he had a, out a can of, of shaving cream and a razor, and in the middle of a very crowded train, he was actually shaving his face, you know, right there in the middle of the train ride, and I'll be the first to admit that, you know, it is kind of amusing. It's not something you see every day in the middle of a very crowded tr uh, train. Somebody has shaving cream all over their face and is, is shaving uh, uh, his face, but before long, without this guy knowing anything about it, that video of him shaving, it had been uploaded to uh, Twitter and then was shared millions of times on social media. And when it was shared, most of the time people were calling this guy things like a slob, a nasty, uh, even an animal. So without knowing it at all, this man had become a laughing stock. His shaving cream covered face was, was famous, uh, among millions of people, but what all of those people who were laughing didn't know or maybe did not care to know is that this guy, they were mocking. He had a name. He had a story. His name was Anthony Torres, and, and when that video of him shaving his face was filmed, he'd just come out of several days of living in a homeless shelter in New York City. The reason he was on that train is because he was going to meet his brother Thomas uh, in New Jersey. This was a brother who'd, who'd wired him money for the train ride and invited him to come stay uh, at his house uh, with his family there. So Anthony was shaving on the train that day because he wanted to look presentable for a brother that he hadn't seen in a very long time. So when meeting his brother, he didn't want to look like he had been homeless, sleeping out on the streets as he had been, and that's why he was so ashamed. He was truly ashamed of that video of him being shared on the Internet and why he told an interviewer, I never thought it would go viral, people making fun of me. Maybe people will have more feeling when they know what I've been through, he said. So well, I don't know about you, but when, when I hear that story, I start to understand why James tells us that friendship with the world is enmity with God. Because really the world has no problem mocking and demeaning somebody who is made in the image of God, someone whom God deemed worth dying for, as, as God deemed Anthony Taurus. So for millions of people, maybe it made them feel better about themselves to share video of a homeless guy on the train shaving his face. Maybe it made them feel better about themselves because they were not him. But then when people who truly know God see somebody in that state, we say there, but for the grace of God, go I. That's our response because even we, we know that judgment will be without mercy to anyone who has shown no mercy. For mercy triumphs over judgment. And we know, as James tells us today, that the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. So as Christians, we know too much about God's mercy to us, ever to hold back mercy from somebody else, whether they deserve it or not. And that's why one great Bible commentator, uh, William Barclay, he has some very profound things to say about mercy in the book of James. Barclay writes, in Christian thought, mercy means mercy for those who are in trouble, even if the trouble is their own fault. Christian pity is the reflection of God's pity. And that went out to men and women, not only when we were suffering unjustly, but also when we were suffering through our own fault. We're so apt to say of somebody in trouble, it's his own fault, or she brought it on herself. And therefore, to feel no responsibility ourselves. But Christian mercy is mercy for all who are in trouble, even if 
they have brought that trouble on themselves. So I'll repeat that last line from William Barclay. Christian mercy is mercy for all who are in trouble, even if they have brought that trouble on themselves. You know what? I'm, I was blessed over, over the past month uh, to see that kind of mercy on display. Mercy for those uh, the world has no use for. I'm talking about a, a, a meeting of, of the church council of Spencer United Methodist Church, one of the churches I pastor, a meeting where Gus uh, Dorena from this church came and, and people from uh, Prevention Point Pittsburgh, they came to petition us. Gus was there just to allow uh, uh, the, the parking lot to be used for a couple hours a week for this clean needle exchange and I will admit at the start of that meeting almost everybody there was very skeptical about allowing this to take place myself included you know we worried that if we allowed something like that we'd be enabling the opioid epidemic that's ravaging our neighborhoods right now but after we were after we got an education an education on the effectiveness of these programs in preventing HIV other diseases like hepatitis, heart disease, from spreading more than they are in our streets, and even more after we heard Gus's testimony. Gus's testimony that without a program like this available earlier in his life, that he would likely be dead right now. You know, we prayed about it, and we decided we needed to give this, this program a try. And honestly, I believe this world is a better place, and I believe my life is more personally enriched because Gus is alive right now in doing ministry uh, to addicts in our community. And even more, if a person who is addicted to drugs is dead, they certainly have no chance of getting into recovery then. That's not going to happen in that case. So I said, well, how could I not support a program that, that would bring the drug users out of the shadows where they're currently hiding, doing drugs in shame, and at least connect them to other people into a relationship with trained counselors, others, who are going to be working for their healing. So when it comes down to it, I believe that that program is treating drug users not as an issue, but as fellow human beings like you and me who are in need of help. And there's no doubt in my mind at all, no doubt that those are the kind of people that Jesus Christ himself was blasted repeatedly for spending his time with. And no, I don't believe that, that our Lord Jesus would, would approve of everything they do, but he certainly doesn't approve of everything you and I do either. But we thank God that he's merciful to us regardless of that. You know, in, in these times, I've turned a lot lately to a, 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 a phrase I heard several years ago from a very famous uh, Pittsburgher, uh, Fred Rogers, host of the children's program, uh, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, and there was a great uh, documentary I saw earlier in the summer about him, and Fred Rogers was an ordained minister, and I have to think that he loved and, and knew and loved the book of James very well, because Mr. Rogers said something that sounds a whole lot like James. Rogers said, I believe that appreciation is a holy thing, that when we look for what's best in a person we happen to be with at the moment, that we're doing what God does all of the time. So in loving and appreciating our neighbor, and our neighbors, we are participating in something sacred. And there's a story about him that, that really shows by his actions what he meant by that, I believe. It was when he was on this trip out to California, and uh, he a trip where he was filmed visiting Coco the gorilla, but on that same trip, Rogers took time out of his schedule to visit this fan of his uh, who lived out there. This was a young boy with cerebral palsy. In, ad in, in addition to that handicap, this boy had suffered physical abuse from one of his caretakers when he was a, a child, and he, 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 endure, he suffered from low self-esteem, a lot of anxiety, and his mother wrote to, to Mr. Rogers saying that it would mean the world to her son uh, if he would come and meet with him, and, and Fred Rogers granted that request and visited uh, this, this, uh, this young guy at his home, and when Mr. Rogers entered the boy's room, well, the boy broke down and, and couldn't speak at all. He was just so nervous, and he, he was so anxious that his mother had to take him out of the room and, and get him calmed down. But when he came back in, Mr. Rogers was waiting for him, and, and Mr. Rogers actually looked at him in the eye and said, I would like you to do something for me. Would you do something for me? Of course, the boy said, yes, he would. And Mr. Rogers said, I would like you 
to pray for me. Would you pray for me? And the boy was amazed at that because, uh, you know, he'd been prayed for a whole lot uh, by other people, but he had never been asked to actually be the one to pray for somebody else. And he was touched by that. And, 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 and he, as he thought about it, he said, well, yes, he, he, would, he would keep Mr. Rogers in prayer. And when he became adult, an adult, this, this young man with cerebral palsy, he spoke often about what that did for his self-esteem, knowing that a, a man who was as close to God as Mr. Rogers was would, would like him enough to, to ask him for his prayers. But when Mr. Rogers looked back on that story, he, he saw things in a different light because one day when an interviewer complimented him on, on his wisdom and knowing that it would make that boy feel better about himself to be asked to pray for him, Rogers responded, oh no, that's not why I asked him to pray for me at all. I didn't ask him for his prayers for him. I asked him for me. I asked him to pray because I think that anyone who has gone through the challenges that he's faced in his life must be very close to God. And I asked him because I wanted his intercession. I needed him to pray for me. Now, when I hear that story, I understand what Rogers means by that quote, that appreciation is a holy thing, that when we look for what's best in a person we happen to be with at the moment, we're doing what God does all of the time. Even more, I, I understand better the love that Jesus Christ has for me. Because when, when Jesus looks at me, he doesn't see me for it first and foremost in terms of the mistakes that I have made or, or in the wrong that I have done. When Jesus looks at me, he sees me as worth dying for. And he sees you. He sees you in exactly that same way. When God looks at us, he sees us in the light of the cross. He sees us in the light of the cross where his son Jesus Christ put himself in our place and gave himself for us all. Now in spite of our rebellion and mercy, he gives himself so fully, so completely for each and every one of us that you and I need never doubt that we are loved, that we are valued. And that's a love that doesn't just appreciate what, what's best in us with words. It's a love that, that makes us worthy of being loved. Just as Fred Rogers in that story helped that boy with cerebral palsy feel worthy of being loved. So that's a love that dignifies and makes new. It's a love that gives us strength to resist the devil in all of his pride and instead to draw near, draw near to a God who loves us, a God who humbly gave himself in our place to save us. So may that love bless and keep us now. May that love empower us to live so that others see the love of God shining in us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.